Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Zach Rowe. I'm a manager on the prevention team at NASTAD. I will invite NASTAD Board Chair Deanne Gruber to speak in a moment, but first I want to review our webinar etiquette. At this time, all participants will be placed on mute for the presentation. If you have questions, you can type them in the message window or wait until the end of the call when we will open for discussion. This webinar is scheduled for one hour and we will stay within these time constraints. The webinar will be recorded and archived on NASTAD's website. Now, I'd like to welcome Deanne Gruber, NASTAD Board Chair, to start us off. Deanne? Hi, everyone. Um, um, good afternoon, and, and thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Deanne Gruber, the STD HIV Program Director for the Louisiana Department of Health, and, the, and for this year, the, the Chair of the Board of Directors for NASTAD. On behalf of NASTAD, welcome. And I would like to particularly welcome John Sapiro and Carmen Batista from the Arizona Department of Health Services, as well as Jaron Benjamin of Housing Works and the Act Now End AIDS Coalition. Again, I'm so happy everyone can join us today. So in 2016, we inaugurated the Chairs Challenge, a project that was developed to leave a legacy related to an issue of the Chairs choosing. And last year, I decided to focus on efforts to end the epidemics of HIV and viral hepatitis. And as part of this challenge, I asked each jurisdiction to begin to accelerate their right size strategy that would move them towards ending the epidemics in their jurisdiction. While we fully recognize that there are many influences at play in addition to accepting NASTAD's challenge, I am, we are very excited that as of February, 13 jurisdictions have already established plans and 10 additional jurisdictions are well on their way to developing one. In addition, several have begun local discussions about what shape their plan could take. And so I wanna say thank you to all of you. This progress is extraordinary. And I know that collectively, these plans and efforts will make an impact and lead us to ending the epidemics. Also, you know, today while we're on this webinar, I'd like to highlight another component of the Chairs Challenge, and that is the ending the epidemic success stories. Throughout the year, we've collected stories from you, our members in the field, that demonstrate examples of your jurisdiction's commitment to the innovative and impactful programming that are keystones to no new infections. And if you haven't done so already, I encourage you to please check these out. All of them can be found, all of the stories can be found at nasted.org slash success stories. So together with our partner, the Act Now End AIDS Coalition and other national efforts, we will continue this work. And I wanna thank you again for participating today. I really look forward to hearing the discussion generated by our presenters. And I know that this takes us one step closer to ending the epidemics. Again, thank you so much. Zach? Thank you, Dan. So our first presenters today are Carmen Batista, the Ryan White Part B Program Manager, and John Sapiro, the Chief of the HIV Prevention Program for the Arizona Department of Health Services. They are going to share with us the process of and lessons learned from developing their plan to end the epidemics in Arizona. Here's a brief look at our agenda. Um, we've already proceeded through the introduction. We're going to look at Arizona. We'll move from uh, in, then into Act Now and AIDS and then into uh, an open forum for discussion. Uh, John and Carmen, take it away. Great, thank you so much. Are you able to hear me? Yes, we are. Excellent, thank you. I'm John Sapero. Carmen, are you on the line as well? I certainly am. Excellent. Uh, I'm John Sapero. I'm the office chief for the HIV prevention program. Uh, I'm housed at the Arizona Department of Health Services in Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, I'll let Carmen introduce herself uh, on the portion of the presentation she'll take just a little bit in. If we can go to the next slide, please. So today, um, we're going to share how Arizona developed what we call our audacious kick-ass plan to end the HIV epidemic statewide. And to do that, we're going to discuss our pre-planning mindset and our planning activities and processes, which I'll discuss. And then Carmen will segue into um, how we have acted on that plan and 
promoted it to the community and the results of those efforts. And by the end of the presentation, you should know a little bit more about what we're doing to engage our state um, to achieve victory over HIV. Next slide. So historically in Arizona, um, our previous HIV planning efforts have been this. Um, if we go to the first bullet, so we've had zero community input. And when I say that, that's a very general statement, but what I mean by that is that um, mostly it was planning members who did the, who informed the plan. So it was developed statewide with about 15 to 30 people. And often that may have been developed statewide by four or five programmatic people. There was very little collaboration with programs. There was little to no prevention and care integration. So we had a prevention plan, a care plan. Um, quite often, the goals of these plans weren't measurable. So you would hear things like, we want to promote, we want to assess this, we want to support this. So there wasn't really a way to evaluate the outcome of the efforts. There was little to no public awareness of the plan. And as a result of that, we can go to the next slide. We cried quite a bit because it was very challenging being a community member uh, to know that these plans existed, but that really there had been very little involvement from community stakeholders and that more importantly, our community didn't know what was going on. And we're seeing that now. We actually had um, an article that just came out in the Phoenix New Times talking about the lack of understanding and awareness of HIV among young people here in Phoenix. Uh, and I think that this was contributed to that is that there was really no knowledge of what was being done at a programmatic level to combat HIV. So let's go to the next slide. So when the new guidance came out and it had the joint expectations of prevention and care collaboration, we started asking ourselves, what if? And we started dreaming really big. So if we go to the next slide. So we had a dream. And the first part of that was we wanted to be collaborative. Uh, Carmen's program, my program, the other Ryan White programs, and many of our HIV organizations enjoy a collaboration that um, and willingness to collaborate that I think has probably never existed in the state before. And we not only wanted input from our planning body members and the typical agencies that would provide HIV services, we knew we wanted extensive input from people living with HIV, um, staff of other programs, non-elected and elected community leaders, and we would treat all of that information as equal. Next bullet. The second one was we were going to be aspirational. Uh, we had a lot of discussions, and you'll see later on some of the outcomes of, of that, but we had a lot of discussions of how detailed this plan would be, and I think Carmen and I did a great job of conveying to everybody, we are going to end Arizona's HIV epidemic. We need you to succeed. You need to join us, and uh, that is carried through the entire uh, process, planning process that we've had. We were very fortunate. We were able to integrate both the prevention and care programs here at Arizona Department of Health Services and also integrate our planning with the Ryan White Part A Planning Council that oversees metropolitan Phoenix planning and resource allocation for metropolitan Phoenix. Next. We were going to be data driven. So we have this kind of local mantra, mantra data driven, needs based, not anecdotal. And so we decided very early on that we were going to share as much data with our planning bodies and our stakeholders as possible, that there was also a golden triangle related to that data, that local data, national data, and personal experience, expertise, and passion all have merit. Some of them, but there's a scalability to that. And so we couldn't overlook what our local data was telling us because our heart was telling us something different or let national data overshadow what might not be happening locally. But we did recognize very early on that, that especially that personal expertise, experience, and passion had a great component that we wanted to retain. Next. 
We wanted to be needs-based, just like I said, and consensus, consensus on what's important among our stakeholders and goal-oriented. We wanted to set very high impact performance expectations that we could measure. In other words, next slide, we could get stuff done. Uh, and we were really excited about that and moving forward on that end. So next slide. With that, we started laying down the plans of our strategic planning and community engagement. If we go to the next slide, you'll see our integrated plan components. And these were standardized just as review, um, the collaboration between the CDC and HRSA, um, identified all of these that we had to roll up to the goals of the national HIV AIDS strategy, that we had prescriptive numbers of goals and strategies, and we had to include metrics to monitor progress. Next slide. So here's what we did in our year one stakeholder engagement. We brought approximately 130, 140 people together in a room. And we asked them two questions. And these are people statewide. Um, they were brought to a free two-day symposium. The first day was an education session that allowed them to um, learn more about HIV, about best practices, and about what was going on nationally, and then bring that information to inform day two. So the first, um, that day two process was a day-long strategic planning session to ask these two questions. What needs to happen in the next five years to end the HIV epidemic in Arizona? And what are the barriers that might stop us from achieving this audacious goal? And the process was very simple. We had people write down seven to 10 ideas individually. Then they teamed up with a person and shared all of their ideas. And among them, those two people, they chose the six best. And then within the small group that we had, because each group had about 10 to 12 people total, um, we asked them to share within a small group and find common themes. And then next, all of those common groups came together then, and you can see on the right side here, I won't go through all of them, but you can see that they came up with some um, exciting themes around how they wanted the work to be accomplished. And then in year two, excuse me, I'm sorry, uh, no, you can go back to the, the state slide. The other thing that came out of this day one process, this day long process, excuse me, is that there was a very clear desire among participants to plan for specific regions. Our northern region is very rural. The cities are spaced out by um, tremendous differences. The native reservations are very far away from metropolitan areas. They felt that they needed to plan specifically for their jurisdiction. Uh, Central Phoenix, which is Maricopa and Pinal County, the greater metropolitan area, had very distinctive challenges and opportunities as well. And then Southern Arizona, which is a combination of um, metropolitan Tucson, which is very urban, and then the surrounding uh, part of the state, which is very rural, and the unique service deliveries there, especially being so close, close to the Mexican border. So next. So here's what we did for our year two. Um, we then came back and had those people come back next year for another half day session. And we said, as you can see on the left, here are all the common themes that you identified in year one as being important to ending the HIV epidemic in Arizona. And on the right side, we have the indicators for the national HIV and AIDS strategy. Um, and if you can click, we ask them to map each of these themes to the indicators. And what happened was the indicators actually became the objectives for our plan. And in doing that this way, um, I think we uh, had a very good opportunity. And this is not the real mapping. This is only just to kind of give you an idea of what we did and how we did it. If we go to the next slide. So you can see here that the alignment around goals, objectives, strategies, and activities. And this is where I think uh, the the way that we did it actually paid off really well. So we didn't go down in order uh, of the plan. You know, we have the National HIV and AIDS Strategy Goal, reducing new infections. Then we skipped a level and we went down to the next part, 
for the strategies. And we ask them to define the strategies in year one and then in year two, map them to the objectives in blue. And we did that purposely because we felt as if we did a step down process and followed them in order, automatically people would default and say, okay, well, if you want to increase the percentage of people living with HIV who know their status to 90%, then you've got to increase more testing and you have to have more agencies doing more testing. And it was really going to be focused on very, very specific things. But when we did it the other way around and we said, what do we need to do? And then mapped it to objectives we got a much broader and more complete picture of what people wanted to do in each of the regions. And you can see here um, in this particular region, prevention, testing, and linkage to care activities, education, and stigma reduction was important to um, increasing the number of people who know their HIV status, and the same on the right side for those who are virally suppressed. And then go next. <clears throat> and then to develop each of those activities that was going to occur for each of the regional plans, we then did a bunch of regional specific community engagement. So we had a day long session in Northern Arizona that was complemented by a number of meetings of the statewide advisory group. In the Southern Arizona and Tucson, we had two day long sessions that were extremely well um, uh, attended and had great conversations. And then here in the central region, the greater metropolitan Phoenix area, we had three to four planning meetings each month between the statewide advisory group and the Ryan White Party Planning Council. And once we got the entire plan together, three full drafts were released for community input. Next. And all in all, we spent nearly 1,500 man hours on the strategic planning for Arizona's three regions. So the takeaways for that, we go through. So why was this method successful? First, um, we required mandatory participation for our contractors. And here's how we did that. We made the meeting a joint contractor meeting for all of the contractors in the Ryan White programs and the HIV prevention program. Then we opened it up to anybody who wanted to participate in the community, including um, our agencies such as HIV surveillance, the STD control program, anybody who worked at an AIDS service organization or a community-based organization, any consumer, anybody who wanted to attend the meeting could attend. Next. And that was a hook. That worked really, really well because a lot of non-contractors um, took part. And the only thing that we asked is that if they came to the symposium on day one, that they attended the planning activities in day two. And by and large, they did. Next. The symposium content was really designed to inform the planning. So all of the content in day one was um, designed to educate people around the tasks that we were going to do in day two, and also offer them opportunities for personal development. And then next, and it focused on local issues and not these broad state goals. So again, we really didn't look at um, achieving these, these very high um, state encompassing uh, objectives, activities, strategies. We really brought it down to regional levels and that was um, really enjoyed by our participants. And we can go to the next slide. Um, the facilitation that we method that we used, which was a combination of personal work, teamwork, small group work, and then larger group consensus building, allowed everybody's voice to be heard, allowed all of those ideas that everybody had to be heard. And at the end of the day, it wasn't any of us um, eliminating ideas. It was build them building consensus about how to use those ideas, join them together, and come up with um, specific activities objectives, goals, and strategies. And there was a ton of sharing. We loved it. I, it was, I, I was so excited to see how engaged people were in it. And then the other thing I think was people really wanted to be involved in the planning, but were never asked, never let it know that it, it was occurring, and didn't even know it happened in many cases until um, much later after the fact when suddenly a plant appeared 
somewhere. Next. Um, people really loved seeing that their input was being acted on. And from year to year, um, people were very, very vocal in their comments in our survey about how they were excited to see that the work that they had done in year one was being utilized again in year two, and they loved that. And so challenges. So clearly, because we made it a mandatory contractor meeting, many people felt forced to take part. We did have hundreds of participants, but uh, there were people in the community that felt that there wasn't enough input, and Carmen can talk about how we engage people living with HIV and people outside of these planning entities later on. Um, for some, there was confusion about the planning responsibilities. We thought we had done a really good job of saying the statewide advisory group would take care of these two regions, and then in collaboration with the Part A Planning Council, we would work on the central region together. Um, but between the two planning bodies, there was some confusion about who ultimately had authority and who was organizing things, what have you. And perhaps most shocking to me, there were people that didn't want the aspirational goals that we were were pushing for and more importantly didn't want the very specific number driven metrics that we were including in the plan and there was actually one person who came in and had done a um, feasibility study using uh, extrapolated out for 20 years around new infections um, loss to care link to care, all of the things that you want to measure. And they kind of extrapolated this out for the next 20 years and figured that we wouldn't ever get there. And why would we want to include, even think about going there? And that was really sad. We can go next. So um, this is Carmen, and I agree that was definitely a little bit of a, a wet blanket moment. Um, but thank you, John, for sharing. We really love this vision for kind of like inclusive and aspirational planning. Um, so we just want to share a quick sampling of our plan and then some of the steps that we've taken to promote the plan of the community. Next slide. So these are our focus populations. Uh, the top groups were common across all the regions and then the pink groups were a little unique. And what I thought was really interesting was our planning body's ownership over this plan. So um, when they actually reviewed the draft, they, were, they asked the question, why aren't transgender individuals called out specifically? And so this already includes a revision that the plan went back and looked at all of the activities after it was finalized um, and they decided that they wanted to add transgender in. And I thought that was absolutely amazing. Next. So John talked about all of our activities and as you probably guessed, that led to a lot of individual activities across the region. So 201 to be exact. And some were, some were duplicated, and we have listed here some of the most common activities. Um, and as John mentioned earlier, in writing this plan, we really focused on what would help us to end HIV, which resulted in more than a few activities that are going to require some outside help. You know, some other jurisdictions, like Colorado did this as well, uh, where they're just like, this is important, and we're putting it in even if we're not 100% sure who's going to do it. Next slide. Uh, so I think uh, this, Next couple of slides violate our common PowerPoint principles, uh, but I did want to share with you a sampling of some of the original language from the planning bodies. I promise not to read it. Uh, but here we have under our community engagement strategy, you know, John talked about the importance of having regional planning. And so we can see some of the diversification that came from that. Northern region calling out work with governments and tribes, central region focused on immigration, and then southern region focusing on community-driven engagement of private clinicians. Next slide. Under the prevention, testing, and linkage to care strategies, uh, we've done a lot of planning in this area before. And so historically, there's been a bit of, we're just going to repeat what we did last year, um, but we're really excited to see the community's desire to expand capacity of the system. So whether that was working with more substance abuse agencies, expanding those testing sites, or starting prep pilots. Next slide. So one of the benefits of this regional approach is that as the separate regions work to develop their own tools, we'll be able to share them across the state. So under the patient-centered care strategy, we can see the priorities for patient-centered care are patient-focused, 
and then clinician focus and hospital and corrections focused initiative. And so those are definitely things that we are excited to be working separately within the regions, but then we will want to roll out across the state later. Next slide. Uh, under our streamlined process strategies, we just, I wanted to share this. I thought that the Southern Region activity of creating a universal enrollment and data sharing to include non Ryan White services was very interesting. Um, and it was really some of that creative thought that came out of that, those group planning sessions. Next slide. Under stigma reduction strategy, we were excited to see the use of existing avenues and specific focused activities. Um, and historically, we've really wanted to build new products just for us, uh, but we really saw a shift in movement that we want to be partnering with existing coalitions and established efforts. And this is really an area I think that on the prevention side, they've been really good about working with established networks and, and non traditional partners. But on the care side, uh, we've really just been kind of focused on ourselves. And so we're excited to be moving in this, this next direction. Next slide. So after we created and finalized and submitted this beautiful plan, uh, we found out that the city of Phoenix was going to become a 90-90-90-0 UN AIDS fast track city. Next slide. If you're not familiar, uh, this is a little equation of what the 90-90-90-0 stands for. Um, this has a separate end date, but it, as a red state from Arizona, we were really excited to see this political support for HIV efforts. Um, and we saw a good opportunity for our, our own integrated plan to align with the City of Phoenix efforts. So our advisory group and the statewide advisory group voted that our integrated plan would be considered a stepping stone to these 90-90-90-0 goals. And this has also helped me on the Part B side because those are additional efforts that I can help spend some rebate months on. Next slide. So we, we really love our plan, um, but we were also really intentional about how we shared the plan. Uh, we definitely went through some detail with our providers, but I think realistically we knew pretty quickly that uh, maybe not everyone is gonna read 198 pages of beautifully written plan. So we wanted to include people, we wanted them to feel inspired, and then to allow people with different levels of interest uh, and different levels of time to know about our plan, to see key components, and then move about the country. Next slide. So at the very basic level, we took our, our statewide plan, and John broke it out, so now there's regional version. So there's a northern version, and a central version, and a southern version. And those are all posted to HIVAZ.org. Uh, but we wanted to make an even more compact version of the plan. So here you can see a copy of a little booklet. And we worked with a media company to create this book. And I thought they did an amazing job and it really gave an additional credibility to our documents. So within this booklet, it's about 16 pages and it's really designed to engage our community leaders and our potential partnering agencies. And on this slide, you can see this is a takeout from the booklet and it's a poster that we're setting up for agencies and for Joe Public. Uh, we're also creating like one, like two pages or two sided handouts that we can distribute for clients and other community members. Uh, but we want to have something visual and this demonstrates the continuum of care and how people move through the process, newly diagnosed, out of care, and HIV negative people. And uh, with an intent to meet people where they are, we also made a video. So, we love this video. We think it captures the hope of our movement while honoring, all, I think, all the sacrifice and the hard work that has come before it. Let me start.
that is our, our video, Sam Sound. And um, we have it posted on an external site. Our, our State Department is like a little bit more conservative. And so we keep it there. And I think we're possibly out of time for questions, but we will be around for the discussion. Is that a fair assessment, Zach? Uh, yes, that's correct. We will take okay. questions and just uh, at the end. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Carmen, and thank you, John, for sharing the incredible work that you've led in Arizona. I would now like to welcome Jaron Benjamin, the VP of Community Mobilization for Housing Works, who is going to highlight the work of the ACT Now and AIDS Coalition, which is open for all to join and is committed to mobilization to end the epidemics. Jaron? Thank you very much, Zach. You can, uh, am I coming through okay? I hope, hope people can hear me. Yes, you're all set. Great. So first of all, I just want to offer some uh, some praise to Arizona. When when I heard about Arizona's plan, I was thrilled. Being from uh, from spending 28 years of my life in Texas and Oklahoma, I understand sometimes how tough it is for uh, for health department to get uh, to, to get something moving, uh, especially in places where you haven't seen the numbers uh, that you've seen in, say, New York City or San Francisco. So it made me quite proud to be a Southwesterner. Uh, and so just, uh, just lots of praise for the work that you all are doing out there. So as Zach mentioned, uh, I'm uh, working with the coalition Act Now and AIDS. Uh, it was a coalition that was just uh, recently launched publicly last September at the U.S. Conference on AIDS. If we can go to the next slide, I'll kind of talk a little bit about uh, the origins of the coalition. Uh, some people may be familiar uh, with a more than 10-year-old grassroots coalition called Campaigns and AIDS, uh, which actually resulted from a caravan, uh, from planning a caravan in Washington, D.C. to demand uh, a, a national plan to end AIDS. It was a very, su a very successful and very moving uh, caravan. Uh, people who put that together then decided that they wanted to form a more permanent body. Uh, now, this uh, this group of uh, of activists, out of this group of activists, there was only one organization involved uh, at fiscal sponsor, and that was Housing Works. Um, and uh, the activists were sometimes loosely affiliated with aid service organizations, although not uh, not explicitly. And there was uh, very little health department uh, involvement. So uh, when I joined the team at Housing Works uh, back in 2014, and as we were nearing the 10-year anniversary of campaign and stand aids, I began to uh, to assess the efficacy of that organization. And I, I found that there was a lot of passion and that there had been uh, a lot of success, but that, uh, that we were missing out on some opportunities, that we needed to diversify the model a little bit. So uh, while this was happening, while we were evaluating uh, campaigns and AIDS, we were also getting a lot of traction in New York State uh, with the with New York State uh, Department of Health and AIDS Institute. Uh, the governor there, uh, Governor Andrew Cuomo, had uh, on numerous occasions taken, uh, you know, bold steps towards uh, making something like a declaration to end AIDS in New York. Uh, and then eventually, finally, he did. He, uh, he committed the state to ending AIDS as an epidemic by by 2020, uh, just what that goal looks like, uh, and this commitment was made back in 2014, what this commitment looks like is going uh, from uh, a little over, I think, about uh, 3,200 new infections per year to less than 750 uh, from the time of the announcement, the time of the plan being enacted uh, to, uh, to 2020. Uh, the uh, amazingly, before we start to dive a little bit into what happened in New York, uh, I'm happy to report that we are actually ahead of schedule looking at uh, the data that's scrolled in. Uh, so this big, uh, bold commitment that some actually thought was impossible and would be um, uh, would 
you would be far out of reach uh, is actually turning out to be well within our reach or actually ahead of schedule. So happy to report that. Uh, so when we started thinking about a less exclusive model, one of the things that was at the top of our list was thinking of ways to communicate, uh, to, I'm sorry, to coordinate community groups uh, efforts alongside the, the efforts of the health departments, whether it's the city or the state health department, because we knew people on both sides and thought that they both had great ideas and just needed to be brought together more. Um, some of the other goals that we had kind of conceptualized along with this model were that we would bring people together across jurisdictions for day-long learning collaboratives. I'll explain a little bit more about that later. Uh, that we should provide technical assistance, either uh, Housing Works or a partner of this new uh, as yet named coalition uh, from either angle, whether it's community-based or whether it was uh, health center-based, I'm uh, sorry, health department-based. And then finally, that we needed to raise money collectively to, to fund this effort. So on the next slide, uh, we can see Governor Cuomo making the announcement uh, or, that he was releasing his, his plan uh, to end AIDS in New York State as an epidemic by 2020. Uh, now, between June 2014, when the governor released the three-point plan uh, in the New York Times, and April the 29th, uh, there was a lot of work that was done. The, uh, the community and the health department worked together to form a 64-person committee of experts. Uh, I think they did a really good job of making sure that nobody got left out, that all demographics were very, very well represented. Uh, and it, between, uh, between June uh, and April, actually, the, uh, the blueprint was finished on January and then was under review for a bit, and we were waiting for the right time to, to, un to unveil it. Uh, so in those, in those you know, less than six months, uh, folks got together on a number of times and put together a, uh, a, a little more brief version of a plan than, uh, than what was put together in Arizona. It's only about 80 pages, but had 30, uh, built out the governor's three-point plan uh, to 37 steps. Now, if we can look at the next slide, uh, we'll see the governor's three-point plan uh, whether we're talking about getting more people tested, which is the first point, the second point, uh, linking more people to care and supporting viral suppression, uh, and then the final point, uh, uh, PrEP and other prevention methods for high-risk populations, a lot of this were, wasn't necessarily anything new uh, that the health department had been talking about. Yeah, the health department was already working on this. The community-based organizations were already promoting these things. Uh, but having the governor come out and put a stamp on, of approval on it was, uh, was pretty good. Uh, if you go to the next slide, you'll actually see, I think, kind of uh, the thing that, that, that took this up a notch. So, uh, if, you know, community groups and the health department are saying the same thing. And you get an endorsement from the governor to come out and uh, and buy into this one and then put a goal on it, uh, an end date of when we're going to end AIDS as an epidemic. We were then able to take this message out to people in New York City very easily. This is something as you'll see the uh, the uh, advertisement on the current style. This was on billboards. This is on buses. This is on train cars. Everybody saw this. And it became, and I'll tell you as a community organizer, I love this because it became so much easier for me to say to someone who may have been a client at Housing Works or somebody who was just hanging out at the LGBT center where, uh, where these turnstiles were near, it was so much easier for us to start the conversation about how we get from, uh, from where people are, people who are undiagnosed, people who aren't on treatment to the end of the epidemic. We were then able to very easily start the conversation about what enables this stuff that we know works. We know that we need to test more people. We know that we need to get people immediately into treatment. We know people uh, need to be offered every tool in the toolbox when it comes to prevention. But what about housing? What about discrimination against transgender uh, uh, populations? What about, uh, you know, what about all these other things that are barriers uh, to treatment? So 
the, I think the takeaway here is that uh, by having community and the health department and uh, elected officials all working together lockstep, uh, the community was able to push uh, for things that were otherwise unwinnable. Housing Works was founded to, uh, to fight for housing for people that did not have an AIDS diagnosis. Uh, so people who had been diagnosed with HIV but did not have an AIDS diagnosis were not uh, able to qualify for housing assistance in New York City. Uh, because of what the governor was doing, because of uh, the embrace of this effort, we were finally able to get this done at the state and city level so that New York City dwellers who were HIV positive and otherwise met uh, requirements were able to get the housing assistance and didn't have to wait to get sicker. Uh, so it, it, really, uh, it really was a game changer. And the, the amazing thing is that we were able to see a lot of the things uh, that we wanted to accomplish uh, finally get a check mark by it in our notebook. So, again, a lot of the stuff is, are things that we know clinically that work. Uh, the community piece was that we were able to say things as, as community groups that the government necessarily couldn't. So, when we started to see this unfold, uh, we thought, uh, you know, this is 2015, we started to think, well, if we're going to launch a new coalition, we've got to get NASA involved. Uh, we've got to get the, the New York City Department of Mental Health and Hygiene involved and the AIDS Institute at the state level involved uh, because that's really where it's going to happen. Getting the AIDS service organizations involved is one thing, but getting the health departments actively collaborating with us is going to be a 100% game changer. Um, speaking of game changers, on the next slide, uh, <laughs> We uh, hosted meetings with both uh, Bernie Sanders and with uh, Secretary Clinton. Uh, we requested a meeting with Donald Trump uh, because we're a 501c3 organization. And uh, all we got back was a bumper sticker and a letter that uh, let us know where we should send uh, any donations. We were not able to meet with Team Trump before they took office. Uh, but uh, because Housing Works and other organizations were involved, uh, a lot of other aid service organizations were involved, we, we saw the need to, to formalize our activities uh, to differentiate our work that we're doing that may be explicitly political uh, from, other, uh, from other work that is dedicated just to getting more jurisdictions uh, to, uh, to declare that they are ready to commit to any AIDS as an epidemic. Uh, so um, on the next slide, uh, there's a list of all the more than 20 organizations that at USCA 2016 formally launched uh, the, uh, the Act Now and AIDS Coalition. Uh, the Act Now part kind of is a shout out to ACT UP. And, and AIDS is, is where we are now. We're now, uh, I think, under the leadership of Dr. Gruber and others uh, ready to start this final push and hopefully uh, will be the la you know will be the the end of the book on HIV and AIDS um, when we when we look back on uh, on our history uh, in the United States. I, I think it's it's worth noting that not only was Dr. Gruber uh, there at the launch, not only was she a speaker uh, but NASDAQ has been with us every step of the way, and our government partners are just as important and in some ways uh, more, important, more important uh, than, uh, than our uh, aid service providers and uh, community-based organizations. And it's mainly because they, uh, they have the ability to do things that the community just can't. The community can, can provide guidance, can provide suggestions, but uh, we can't. <laughs> We can't actually implement these plans without, without help. Uh, at USCA, we hosted a day-long uh, four-part learning collaborative that was very well attended uh, by more than 200 folks, just a discussion about what it will take to end AIDS as an epidemic, whether it's data and research, whether it's community mobilization, uh, whether it was uh, looking at the clinical side. 
Uh, it was very well attended and was very exciting. Uh, the next slide, we'll go through these very quickly. Uh, at, uh, you know, on top of offering technical assistance, which I'm proud to say we were, uh, we were doing so with Houston, uh, with Massachusetts, uh, and uh, our, our allies in the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene actually have a grant to, to go down to the health department, uh, Dr. Dimitri Daskalakis, if folks know him already. Uh, they're going around the country and helping folks out from the health department side uh, to, to help figure out how, how do we actually do this? How do we, what, what work needs to change? What, what work plans need to be implemented? Um, so I think that we've, we've, we're well on our way to achieving the goals. If you look at the next slide, um, oh, uh, we, we do meet quarterly. Our next meeting is in uh, Washington, D.C. on May 9th. I'm sorry, May 8th. So if you're interested, please email me. Where can you find my email? It's actually on the last slide of the presentation at the bottom. Um, and very briefly, I'll just chat about what we're doing at USDA 2017. Uh, I think we're going to host four pathways and uh, the opening plenary, the uh, ACNA and AIDS Coalition will, uh, to promote national dialogue on ending AIDS as an epidemic in the United States. Um, I think that in spite of the threats to healthcare delivery systems that we face, we still uh, have to keep fighting, and I am inspired uh, very much so that uh, many of our partners around the United States continue to do so as well. And that is all I have, and I will give it back to that. Thank you, Jaron. I'm going to now unmute the lines for anyone who would like to ask questions of Carmen, of John, or of Jaron. Um, we do have a little bit of time. You are able to type questions into the chat window if you're logged into Zoom, uh, or if you're just on the phone and you wish to speak out loud, please do so now. If you don't intend to speak, please mute your line uh, so that we can prevent any background noise is do a like uh, every other week have him come to NASDAQ and do like a big thing. I haven't thought about having him. We talked about doing like yoga and things like that right around the annual meeting. And if you are not going to ask the question, again, please mute your phone to prevent the background noise. Thank you. Um, so I think one uh, commonality that I uh, heard between both um, uh, John and Carmen's presentation and Jaron's presentation was time. Uh, so Jaron, uh, you really like emphasized that you had a short time window. This was just six months. Uh, John and Carmen, it sounds like uh, the Arizona plan took a lot of time and energy. And I'm curious uh, to hear what your thoughts are around um, states or jurisdictions that may be planning to create ending the epidemic plans, uh, how much time they should be allotting for, uh, and what lessons learned you had around kind of time preparation. So, John, do you want to take the lead? Yeah, so I would say initially with the with planning the symposiums that, such as we did, <clears throat> it took about four to six months to plan each of those events uh, and get the speakers together. Uh, that was actually a great opportunity for us to collaborate with the community as well because they provided great input into what they wanted to see in terms of sessions and it was also an opportunity for them to showcase local best practices so a lot of the presentations were either our contractors or people serving the hiv population that were doing great work so that was really awesome I liked that it took us longer to plan rather than shorter because we were able to engage so many people and get so much feedback over that time and really have an opportunity to uh, get the objectives, strategies, activities really well formulated from broad ideas to very, very specific activities. Carmen? Um, and I would just add, I think uh, what's nice about planning right now is that we don't have a due date that you have to turn it in, uh, which we did have with the integrated plan. 
And so what we found was that when we got into the nitty gritty of the activity planning, that that seemed to take maybe about three times longer than we had estimated. And so I think one of our kind of funny, not funny stories is that since we were, we were stacking the meetings and we hadn't anticipated that it would be as much, um, I think some folks thought we were being racist and specifically trying to exclude people. Um, so that would be my lesson advice to make sure that there are plenty of sessions that are scheduled in advance so that uh, the perception is that everybody can come and participate. Mm -hmm. This is Sharon. I'd like to add that the only reason why our timeline appears to be so short is because the community had already been collaborating for more than a year, I think for more than uh, two years, on exactly what they'd like to see if such a thing were, were written. Uh, so I think giving yourself more time is probably a good idea. Uh, we have a question from California on how you uh, quantify prep usage. Um, is, has there been any work done around the quantification of prep usage in your jurisdiction and how are you doing that? So I can speak to what's happening in New York. I think that uh, the way that, uh, that New York has, so first of all, New York entered an agreement with the with the pharmaceutical company uh, and was able to get PrEP in bulk. Uh, and so so there's that. There's also, uh, I think, in, in New York State, it's, it's a lot easier to get the data both from the drug companies and say this is this is how many prescriptions we're, we're, we're getting where we're where they are. Uh, you know, what demographics as far as you know, the, the private insurers higher higher income, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and then uh, on sometimes on the lower income side, uh, especially if they're being prescribed through an F2HC because they have to track uh, their numbers in order to remain in F2HC, we're able to get a pretty good picture of, of PrEP usage in, uh, in New York State. Sorry, Zach, for us. <laughs> Uh, so we had we had done a prep assessment in 2015 where we surveyed providers that were either offering prep or thinking about offering prep uh, about their capacity, their knowledge, their client existing client base, as well as community entities um, around their perceptions around prep uptake attempting to do a, a calculation of how many MSM in the metropolitan Phoenix area might make PrEP candidates based on testing patterns and trying to determine the number of MSM that might actually live in the city. Uh, and then also establishing PrEP navigation services um, as a pilot with three entities. So what we generally saw when we did consumer assessments and even in this provider assessment was that about half of the people that we um, assessed knew about PrEP in some manner, but when it got down to are you on PrEP, it was about 3%. And that was the an informal PrEP navigation program from the county health department here had about the same uptake. So we were expecting about three to 5%. So I just sent you, however, from one of our aid service organizations, his report out for his first full month of prep navigation. And he's actually built this amazing dashboard to trap, track his uh, prep clients. And Zach, if you want to look that over and then send that out to folks, um, he built this in Access uh, and reports it out to me in a PDF. So that might give you um, a great tool for people to see how we're monitoring our prep navigation progress. Okay. 
Thank you for sharing that, uh, John, uh, and we certainly will. We're also going to, uh, I, want, I want to first apologize for not being able to project the sound for Arizona's video, um, but there will be a recording of this webinar along with a link to the video that we'll send out through the NASDAQ listserv. And we'll also upload to our website and I'll be sure to um, add that prep tool that John just mentioned to that um, distribution as well. So you should uh, have some resources that you can expect in the coming days. Uh, we're now at the end of our hour, so uh, to respect your time, we have to bring our call to a close. If you have any follow-up questions, please contact NASDAQ or any of our presenters directly. Their information is currently on the screen. Um, thank you again for joining us today. I hope that in coming together, you have found inspiration in the lessons learned by our presenters and that you can translate that into the work to end the epidemics of HIV and viral hepatitis. Have a great week. Thank you.